Hi, so this is probably the first video I've ever done, uh, but this is Diane of the Vikings Vinland, and I'm going to do try to teach null binding, and I teach it slightly differently than some of the other videos. Um, so I teach it uh, not using the thumb, so I don't do the stitch on the thumb. I do know how, and I've learned at least how to do it afterwards, but I find it actually more complicated to learn, especially when you're first learning null binding. So this is very much a beginner null binding video. Uh, so I'm starting with some Lana Loft worsted weight. Um, it's a single ply. Uh, I find null binding with a single ply much easier than uh, null binding with uh, a double, a two ply, but I do have, I have done, and I, I do have, this is a triple ply wool. Uh, you do want to look for wool because then you can actually, uh, as they call it, split, spit, splice the pieces together. The big difference between null binding and uh, what most people would know of today is uh, crochet or knitting is you're actually working with a length of yarn rather than uh, with the ball of yarn. So you, the first step of course is to actually pull off a length of yarn uh, to work with it. So it's much more similar to sewing in that regard. So the first thing I do is I actually pull off a length of yarn. Uh, preferred length that I use and it's quite often referred to as a working length. As you get more comfortable you can work with longer lengths but about the length um, from your fingertip to nose um, when your arms outstretched that will give you a reasonable amount and then if you want to just add a little bit another fingertip to nose so then you have twice that and so then that's a good amount to work with it should not get as tangled um, if you are still feeling like your, your wool is tangling too much on you feel free to use a shorter length now the only thing with working with longer lengths it means you don't have to splice them as often so I'm now working with just a length of wool and now let's talk about needles. So there are many different needles you can use. If you are just starting out and you're not sure if this craft is for you, I recommend picking up or finding a darning needle. They're fairly cheap, they're fairly easy to find, and they at least have the big eyes so that you can actually thread your wool onto them. They also don't have a sh super sharp pointy uh, tip to them so they don't actually uh, uh, go into your your threads as much as uh, as any other type of needle. So that's if you're just starting out. Of course, Vikings didn't have darning needles. They generally had wood or bone needles. Now these ones are fairly long. They don't have to be this long, um, but you can easily make a wooden needle. Uh, I recommend a very uh, closed grained wood so that your yarn doesn't catch on it. And um, uh, making the the hole for the eye of the needle. Uh, you can use a Dremel or uh, if you're really wanting to be authentic, a little uh, spoon, <laughs> spoon uh, uh, what's the word? Spoon. Wood. No. Yeah, spoon. Anyways, a, a spoon. I think it's called a spoon thing. Anyways, okay. um, but just make sure that you sand out the eye of the hole. Otherwise, it will snag on on the yarn. Um, but yeah, and then uh, just oil them up once you're done and they're good to go. The bone ones do def uh, definitely take a lot more uh, work to uh, to to get them uh, into a bone needle but they are very nice to work with because they're very smooth and they're very easy to use. I'm going to use my bone needle today. Um, my favorite bone needle, I don't know where it went, but it's a nice short little stubby one. Um, if you have arthritis, there's also examples you'll want to use, if you have arthritis, you'll want to use the longer ones. I find they're just easier to hold on to, so you're not trying to hold on to a little tiny needle. You can also find ones where the hole is actually closer to the center of the needle, and they're actually quite long. So they're they're fairly, actually I should use this one since the background is quite light. Um, so they're fairly, qu they're quite long, and they kind of have, it looks like they're a two, two uh, tipped needle, and the, the, the hole is in the middle. Those ones are apparently really comfortable for people with arthritis, so feel free to make them with uh, quite a bit longer with the hole closer to the middle. Uh, so actually since, I'm just trying to see which one's gonna show up. Probably I'm gonna use the wood needle just so you guys can see it better. So step one, thread the needle. Now, if your wool is a little bit fuzzy, you can always just uh, twist the end and then uh, pull it through. And just like if you're sewing, you don't wanna pull it so that both tail, t 
tails match up, you actually want to leave a little bit of a stagger so that one tail, uh, so they don't overlap each other. Out of the way. So, um, how I start my null binding and how I teach sort of the beginner stuff is I start with what I think it's called. Um, I'm trying to remember the technical, I'm very bad for technical terms, but it's basically, it's a, it's a slip knot um, in the sense of, and a, this is used in knitting every once in a while, but it's just a, a ring that I'm going to put a bunch of stitches on and then I'm going to pull it tight so it becomes kind of like a little flower. I'm trying to see if I have any to show sitting around. No, that one's started with a chain, but um, that one doesn't start with that. Yeah, I don't think any of these ones do. These are some of my older ones, so I'm just trying to find some of the other ones. Anyways. So it's a simple, simple uh, technique. It's used in other fiber arts, but basically what you're doing is you're taking your long tail and you're gonna hold onto it with your thumb and then you're gonna wrap it around your hand and then you're gonna cross it underneath your thumb. So I'll just show, I'm trying to show all the different angles. So my, my long part is actually closer to my knuckles when I'm actually, when I'm actually got that. And the little short nail, I try to, short tail, I try to keep, uh, tucked into my hand so it doesn't get caught up in everything and then you're just going to hold on to that and then you're going to take your other needle and we're going to do some stitches on it so what I tell people and it's like it sounds a little violent but we're Vikings so it's all good um, is you're actually going to go under this big loop but you're going to make sure that you go over top of the tail so you see see how, how that is and I'm just going to pull it through until I get a little loop. And that's that's one stitch. Woohoo, we've done one stitch. And I'm just gonna do that nine more times, so I have 10. The reason for 10, eh, it seems to work out the best. You can do eight, you can do 12. I always like even numbers, I don't know why, but I like even numbers. You notice that my yarn is actually twisting a little bit, like there's little twists, so always what I end up doing is actually just rotating the needle to try to undo a bit of the twist in the yarn and you'll see those loops then disappear. But there I've done two stitches. So again, I'm always trying to make sure this is the, the long tail is close to my knuckles and then I'm just stabbing my knuckles and again, making sure that I go over top of my tail. So if you go underneath, it doesn't do anything. It just wraps the yarn around your, your uh, loop. And then there we go. I've got two. I've got three now. So I'll just keep doing that until I have ten. Four, five, six, seven. And if they get, if you get too far down your hand, you can always push them up. I'm at seven, eight. Oop, that one's getting a little tight. You want to keep your loops fairly loose. Um, the main reason there is so that you can find them and stick a needle through them. So especially when you have um, these bigger needles, you need to be able to fit that big wide needle through it. And then as that little short tail gets close to your work, you pull on your needle to pull it out of the way. So how many loops am I at? Two. Four, six, eight, nine. So I got one more loop to do. And again, it'll start to try to curl on you. And this is why I said you just got to make sure you get, keep that little tail behind the other one. And there we go. So now we've got our 10. So I can actually put my needle down. And now I've got this loop with a short little tail over here and the long little tail there. And what this is is sort of a magic ring. And when you Hold up, put your feet, hold on to your stitches, and then grab that little tail right over here. And all you're going to do is pull your little tail, and it's going to shorten up your loop until you end up with a flower. And now you've got a little flower. Now that could be the crown of your toque, the toe of your sh of your sock, or the tip of the fingers of the mitten. And that's where you basically start. So this. This tail gets in the way. I warn you now. You will. You it. It does get in the way. But I don't deal with it just yet because I want to make sure I've locked down this flower, and then I'm going to tighten it up. I'm going to thread the needle onto it, tighten it up, and then we're going to stitch it in 
to lock it in. But you can see here that now my stitches go around in a circle, so now I can continue around and around in a spiral um, until I get to where I want to be. So I've got 10 stitches to work on. Now the first stitch I'm going to talk to you guys about, I'm going to show you, is a very, very basic stitch. And the thumb technique actually doesn't work with it because it's too simple. <laughs> uh, but it is the simplest one and it's basically a buttonhole stitch. So I'm going to hold on to this little annoying tail with my fingers so that it doesn't get in my way. I'm going to hold on to my flower with my long tail at the top. Now if you're left-handed you're just basically shifting which hand you're holding everything into. So if you're left-handed you're basically going to be working probably this way and you're going to be working like that so that you can basically holding everything with your your, your right hand so you can work with your left hand. And basically that's just whatever is comfortable for you. So that's all that's really different about doing left-handed versus right-handed with null binding. Um, and then again, I'm holding, keeping this little tail out of the way so it doesn't get caught up in my stitches. And I'm holding the flower with the, basically the end stitch at the very top so I can see what I'm doing. Now again, I want to keep this long bit towards the back. So if you do need to, you can tuck it in behind and hold on to it with your other finger if you're coordinated enough um, or if you've got comfortable enough to do that. It does take a little bit of practice because you are using a lot of fingers to do a lot. It's like holding chopsticks. You're using a lot of fingers to do a lot of things. Uh, but once you get more and more comfortable, this will feel more natural. So again, it's a very simple stitch that I'm teaching you. This is actually not a Viking find of a stitch, but I teach it because it's a really great way to learn how to do null binding and the theory behind it. So what I'm going to do, again, stabbing, you know, Vikings, we stab things. Um, you'll see that the petals of the flower, I've got all the petals sticking out here. So these are now my base for my next row of stitches, are these, these petals from the flower. So I'm going to stab one of the petals. And again, I'm going to make sure I go over top of the, the long tail as I pull through. You'll see it get pulled through to about there. Now this is where your thumb can come into play to help keep your stitches from getting too tight. You want to keep your stitches loose so you can continue to work in them. Because if you pull them too tight, you'll never find them <laughs> on the next round. So, or you, when you find them, you'll be cursing because it's like, I can't get my needle through. So make sure that you keep use your thumb to help keep that tension. Um, and then basically you can always pull your thumb out. The, the finishing step that a lot of people don't do on their null binding is actually full the null binding after they're done. And that basically locks in the stitches. It uh, helps finish them up. It kind of pre-shrinks them a little bit so that um, all these big loops then start to get shrunk a little bit. Um, and that's the best way to finish null binding. So we're not going to get there today, but I'm just going to show you how to do the stitches. So we did a stitch in that first petal. Now before going on to the next petal, we actually want to do two stitches because to get this, we're going to, I'm going to basically show you a bit of a, um, the toe of a shoe, but a uh, toe of a sock, but what we're going to do is we're going to start it out flat because if you want to do something flat, you need to lo add a lot of stitches to keep it flat, but you don't want to add too many. So the first row of stitches, I always tell people to do two stitches in each petal. So you'll see we've already done our one, our one's right there, and then we're going to do a second one. So again, stabbing that same petal and again, making sure it's over top and pulling through. And if you need to, get that thumb in there and make sure it's big enough so that you can work on it later. Like I said, it's actually better to have bigger loops than smaller loops because then uh, you can always find your stitches later, especially when you're first learning. It's going to look like a really big doily, but when you, you can, with wool, we can felt it and make it smaller. It's always easier to make it smaller. So now I've done the two stitches in that first petal. Now I move on to the next petal and again, just stab it and pull it through. And this is what I call the basic blanket hole, blanket stitch of, a, of, of null binding. So again, there's that my second petal. I already got one stitch in there. So now I'm going to do in a second one in there just to keep my, my piece flat, more flat. Because if you just uh, do one stitch, you're going to end up with a very skinny tube, more ready for a finger rather than a, toe, rather than a foot. So 
Actually, what I'll do is a mitten so I can show you guys how to do the thumb. So now I'm on to the next petal, and I'm just going to quickly go through and get around to the next, next edge. Now again, it's starting to twist on me, so I'm turning my needle to undo the twist in my yarn, because it just seems to always build up twist. And I need to do another stitch in that petal. Again, making sure I'm going over top of, of this, this long tail sitting at the back. Do, do. There's one, there's two. And next petal, one. And two. And next petal. Oh, it's still getting twisty. And then I'll also show you guys how to do a spit splice. So something I ask people with doing spit splices is if they're making it for somebody who's kind of germaphobic, at least we usually wash it before we give it back to them. So <laughs> before we give it to them. But um, if they are concerned about saliva being on their project, <laughs> you can always just use warm water. Um, the other thing is when you're out camping and doing this, make sure that your hands don't have bug spray on them because if you lick your hand to get it wet and then to touch, oh, it tastes horrible. Um, speaking from experience, I forgot that I had bug spray on my hands when I was doing this. Uh, da, 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 da. Are we almost back to our beginning? Yep, we're just about there. So two in that one. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you'll start to see that your little flower starts to pop open, but like I said, it's It'll come away. And then on to the next petal. And then two. This is not really an exact science. Um, there are patterns available. So if you do want to find patterns, but they usually are teaching, they're using the thumb technique for how to do the null binding. So it can be confusing, but at least they have quite often have stitch guides. So you know how many stitches to do of each. So this is about the point where we're meeting up with our our previous stitches. So we've got this bit of a gap going on between here. And I'm just going to tighten the flower up again. So you, it's harder to see. So you can see where the middle of your flower is. Um, so now we're going to continue on and we're going to continue to onto the, so basically now we're into the, the next row. So now you've got new petals or basically a base stitches to stitch onto, and those are become the new ones that you stitch into. Now we're onto the next row, so what I recommend at this point is we do two stitches in one, one stitch in the next, two stitches in the next petal, and then one. So you're doing a, a pattern of two in the two stitches, then one stitch, two stitch, then one stitch. And then that basically gives you a little bit more of a flat. Um, otherwise, if you kept doing two stitches in each, you would end up with a really pretty um, petunia, but uh, we don't want a petunia. So it would end up starting to look kind of like this, which we don't want. We want it to be flat on our toes and flat on our fingers and flat on the top of our head. So I did two stitches in that one. Now I'm just going to do one stitch in here. And then the next one I'm going to do two in until I run out of yarn. Then I'm going to show you the next type of stitch so that you can actually see how to read the stitches that you see in books. Because that becomes the next challenge is that you see the, um, there's about three, well there's probably more than that, but there's three main nomenclatures used for identifying the stitches in, uh, in null binding because there are a lot of archaeologists that are looking at this stuff and they come up with sort of their own names for the stitches. Um, some are more abstract, like uh, Oslo stitch, <laughs> um, where others' uh, nomenclature is like uh, type 2 or type 3, which really doesn't tell me which type of stitch that is, so I generally don't use the type 1. Um, so I'm getting to the point where I don't have much uh, yarn to work with, so I'm actually going to show you how to do the split stitch, or the split spit splice. Say that 10 times fast. So. So I'm going to need another, so I'm just going to put my work off to the side and I'm grabbing my ball of yarn and I'm basically going to grab my length and again about two times going from my finger to my nose, outstretched arm, so that I end up with a good amount to work with, but not so much that it's going to get tangled on it. I should do that right in front of the camera. 
there we go. Um, so it's, it's not going to get too tangled and it has a natural twist to it because of course it, it has been spun. So some, one of the things is just to run your finger over it to help get rid of some of the extra twist, but we need to now attach this to the existing piece that we have. Now, one of the things, and like I said, I learn a lot from, I teach a lot from experience. You have two tails on your current piece. You have the piece that you're actually working with and you have the tail from where you started. Don't splice onto the starting tail. I've done it. <laughs> it doesn't help you. <laughs> so if you if you can, if you if you don't want to, um, if we're not quite ready, we're not quite ready to tuck it all in. You can actually just take it and just um, either take a little bit of a twist tie or put a little bit of or tie it off so you don't accidentally splice onto it, <laughs> and you'll know which one you're supposed to splice to. So the way to do this split splice, and there are a few people, there's many different ways, but I basically, I take the end and I actually untwist it to get rid of all the twist. And then I actually split the fibers out because wool does like to um, felt onto wool, but it'll felt onto the closest wool to it. So we want to separate the fibers so they can actually splice onto the fibers of the new piece that we're adding to. So I'm just trying to get the ends separated out. So also so that you don't end up with this weird chunky lump. Um, and then I'm just going to basically using my fingers, I'm just trying to comb it out so that they're all facing the same way. So all the fibers are going the same way. Now something else that I do is I take, take the ends and I just gently try to s separate them out. Now, I don't want to completely separate it, but I'm just trying to lengthen the yarn like a tiny bit. And what that's doing is pulling some of these fibers into a little, to make them a little bit separated. So it's not as big of a thick chunk because we're basically going to have a double, um, double thickness right here. So I do that with the one, put that one down, go find my new piece that I'm going to add in. And I do it the same thing with this end. So again, I untwist the end. So it's all nice and easier to, to open up. Now I have nails, so this makes this a little easier for me, but um, it doesn't take much to get these fibers to uh, separate out. Again, why I use the uh, more the Lopi style yarn with doing this. Uh, the actual Jorvik shoe liner uses uh, a two ply, fairly thin wool. Um, if anybody was ever known it, care to know so it took a lot to do that so again get them all going the same direction and then I'm just grabbing the ends of the fibers and I'm just going to wiggle it apart just a little bit just to try to lengthen it and you can feel it when they start to lengthen but you don't want to pull too much otherwise you're just going to pull it apart and then you'll have to un undo quite a bit so I now have two fuzzy ends and what I'm going to do is I'm going to overlap one on top of the other, making sure you guys can see this. Of course, they're going in opposite directions so that they're now gonna be one continuous ball of uh, length of yarn. Now, they're not, obviously they're not there. So this is where the spit comes in. Now, basically the, the felting wool requires moisture and heat and friction. This is why you don't put wool in your dryer when it's wet. Um, and this is why you don't put your wool in your washing machine on like super agitation because you're just going to felt the wool. So the th basically how this works and how I end up doing is I end up laying my fibers on my one hand ready to go and I lick the other hand. And then I basically start there, squish them together, and then I just roll it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And back and forth. We have moisture, we have heat, and we have friction. So it is slowly felting those ends together. And I basically work my way from the, my piece that I'm working on to the tail. And you can work from one the other direction, but just work from one, one side. And again, I'm just looking and twisting. And I do a little tug to see how I'm doing. Is it getting to stick together? Is it actually working. Don't pull too hard, otherwise you got to start that whole process pretty much over again. But with enough friction and moisture, it is now one continuous piece of yarn. Now I can find the other end 
and thread my needle on it. Make sure I'm in the view here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I get too high, I notice I'm like, oh, I'm off the camera. So again, um, not pulling it all the way through, but just so that my tail is out of the way, but that my work, my length that I'm working with isn't too long. Okay, so we've been doing the very basic stitch, and I've got this fairly nice flat uh, piece to work with. So I'm going to show you sort of an interim stitch. So this is kind of how I, I teach people to start thinking about how uh, to uh, get connected, like get uh, con to the next level of stitches. Actually, can you flip that over so I can read? So I just want to show you guys sort of, so what... Let's see if it'll focus. I think it'll focus. Maybe? Is it focusing? It's hard to tell if it's focusing. So what we've done is basically a, a basic, what I call the buttonhole stitch, or type 1. Um, next we're going to do what's called the York stitch. And you can see this is in a chain, but, um, and you can, so you can actually do this one on your thumb. This one you can't actually do on your thumb, and you can't do a chain because it's really uh, being held together by the previous row. So you can't actually start it as a chain. You have to start it off of another loop. Um, so now we're going to do the York stitch. Um, and so basically the nomenclature, so York stitch is one of the ways to call it. The other um, option to call it, and this one's very visual, so I like this one, is called under, under, and then over, over, over. It's also called type 2. Like I said, the type doesn't really help me. I think it's an academic thing, but I'll show you what that under, under, over, over, over means. So in all of these things, uh, they're assuming that you're actually picking up one of the petals from your base stitch. So your previous row, so you're picking up your, your previous row. So that's not actually in the nomenclature for the stitch. It's just an assumption. There are some uh, later period stitches, which actually you pick up the stitch from the back but pretty much all the Viking ones, uh, they all pick it up from the front. So just keep that in mind when you are looking at some stitch patterns. If they're talking about grabbing it, uh, they might have a way of saying from back or from front. So we're working from the front. And then what we're doing, and this will be a little bit hard to see initially, but I'll show you guys. Basically, we have to go under, under. So we have to go under two stitches, and that's what it's doing. So we're going back to the loops that we actually already created. I don't know if it's going to go in focus if I go any closer. Um, so I'm picking up under and I'm picking up another one under. And then when it's talking about over, over, over is when I'm coming out. So that slash means change directions and go out of your stitch. So when I'm pulling it out, uh, I'm going over this one, over this one, and over my actual uh, yarn that I'm just currently stitching with. So I'll show that a few times just to let you guys see that. And then I'm just pulling through. Now this is where my thumb comes in. That The only reason I use my thumb, again, for tension. So you see how it's on my thumb. I use my thumbnail just because it's really handy, but you can actually use your thumb. If you've got really big thumbs, your stitches are going to be huge. So you can actually just stick your needle in there if you want to. And then just to tighten it up on the needle. Just to make sure that you have a loop to actually work with. Uh, so... I'm going to do uh, single, single double. So when I'm doing stitches again, just to try to keep this flat. So I'm going to do another single stitch. So I'm grabbing from a previous row and I'm going under, under one. And then I have to find that second one, under two. And then if you look on the other side, as I'm pulling it through, I've got over, over, over. And that's how that nomenclature works. It's, it's very visual, so it works well for me because I don't do the thumb thing, which to do a stitch using the thumb technique, you're actually creating these weird crisscrosses on your hand and then you're uh, putting the, the, the needle through somewhere in your hand. So I'm just going to do two on that one just because it's a long way to get over to here. And if you don't quite find your petals, you can always rearrange the, the stitches. Just go put your needle in there and tug on them a little bit just to re-sort them out that's perfectly fine. So I'm going to go pick up my stitch and I'm going to go under, under, and then there's my over, over, over. So there we go. That's, that's the stitch. And that is the Jorvik stitch.
Now the Yorvik stitch actually produces quite a bit of curl, curl to your, uh, so under, under, over, over, over. The Yorvik stitch produces quite a bit of curve to your piece, you'll notice, uh, but it's also very stretchy. So it actually works really good for socks. Um, and it's just something that I found with doing uh, the Oslo stitch. I love the Oslo stitch for toques and mittens, but I really like the Yorvik stitch for socks. Now you'll notice that actually the stitch is quite a bit bigger um, than just the basic buttonhole stitch. It actually takes up quite a bit more room, uh, keeping the same kind of tension. Um, and that's part of it is because you're trying to keep these loops big enough so that you can actually find them and, uh, and pick them up. Um, so when you are looking at patterns, one of the critical things too is also the thickness of your yarn. So I'm using a, what is it called? It's called a worsted weight. There's a bulky weight. There's a bunch of different weights and the weight of your yarn is going to change the size of your project quite drastically. And just to show you, I have a sock and I have the same sock, but just in super bulky. So you can see the size difference. It definitely takes a lot less time. It's the same pattern, same number of stitches, same everything. Just the difference is the size of uh, the yarn being used. So like I said, it's keep that in mind when you're working with different uh, weights of yarn. If you're working with a fairly uh, narrow one, it's going to take a lot more stitches to complete. If you want to get a project done fast, use the super bulky because yeah, that's really fast and they're super warm and super soft. Um, these I have not finished in the sense of I have not, like I've tucked these ends in, but I have not felled them. And that's the proper tech term for it, where I basically, you get them wet and you'll notice how it's kind of got weird lumps and bumps and you can see a bit of my tails from some of my splices. So when you actually go and fell it, you're gonna affect the shape of it. So you're gonna, um, smooth out the shape when you fell it so that's getting it wet with soap and water and basically just rubbing it and making it uh, agitating it just a little bit if you find your socks are too long so if you're like oh my god I made this sock and it's massively long if you get it wet and in the lengthwise direction you rub it this way it'll actually shorten it up same thing as if your sock is too wide work it this way and it will shorten it up. So that's the finishing touch that you do when you're done complete uh, an item. Also with socks and mittens it is very difficult to get two matching ones <laughs> even following patterns. They'll be slightly different just because of depending on your attention and if you start with one and you're in one mood and then you do the other and you're in another mood they end up being very different. Uh, so at least with the fulling process you can actually get them to um, be the same shape and size when you're done. And uh, the other thing with the fulling process is you'll sometimes end up with um, little holes or gaps, basically, not necessarily holes, but little gaps in your work. And it's just nice to just close those up. So you can actually work on that with basically pinching it as it's wet and, uh, and warm with soapy water. And you basically be, be just trying to work out, work those little holes shut. Because if you leave them like that, you could potentially have a toe poke through um, and then they'll slowly get bigger because of course wool, wool likes to move. Um, so it's best if you, especially before you first wear them to go through and basically fold them so that they're nice and solid, um, and ready for the, yeah, cat got, cat got this one. So it's got a few extra loops now in it, but that's the other thing with the fulling process. Yeah. Just rub it down. It'll be gone. So, um, definitely very important as part of that process. So. Now, to do uh, mittens and socks, this is, uh, I'll do a few more of the Yorvik stitch just to show you that. So, oh, I started going into the Oslo stitch, sorry. Under, under, over, over, over. And pull it through. Again, making sure my, ta my, my working length is at the back so I don't actually ac accidentally grab it. Under, under, over, over, and through. Now, if this stitch is still too complicated for you, just stick with the button hole stitch. The only thing is you'll only be able to make toques. To make um, 
socks and mittens, you need a hole in there because we have these things called thumbs and we have these things called heels, um, unless you find a pattern that doesn't require you to do that. But I still haven't found a pattern that doesn't, let, <laughs> doesn't do that for you. Um, so you need to basically create that hole. Well, the only way really to create that hole is to do a chain. So you have to do a chain parallel to your work. So to do a chain, you're basically the only part of the chain that you're the thing the steps that you're you have you skip is instead of picking up from our pedal, you skip that step. So all you're doing is the under, under, over, over. Now I'm obviously putting a hole in the really weird spot. So this is a, either really a mitten for a Barbie doll or something, but just to show you guys how this works. So now I've got this loop that's kind of hanging out all on its own. Well, that's my new loop to work from. So again, I'm trying to do some stitches that are going to be separate from my work. So again, I'm doing under, under, over, over, over. And this gets the trickier part because your work now is a little bit more free to move. So it tends to be a little bit more misbehavy. And it starts to actually, and like I said, the Jorvik stitch, you can see it's actually trying to curl on itself. Uh, the Oslo stitch doesn't have that curl to it, so it sits much nicer. But um, basically, under, so under your first loop, under, because I'm skipping that first step of picking up my stitch, under, under, over, over, and pull through. And I'll do a few more just to show you, and then we'll reconnect so that you can see your hole that would then become for your heel or for your thumb on a mitten. So I'm actually creating a little chain that's going off all on its own uh, that can then eventually be rejoined. Now, when you rejoin it, you try to rejoin it exactly where the same number of stitches down the road so you end up with a symmetrical hole uh, so I've got one two three four loops so I go one two three four loops line up the, that four and four and then stick in so again now I'm back to picking up from my base stitch and then going to go under under over over into the loops and this will actually then join up the two the stitches again so I've got this hole wah, wah, nice little hole so I can actually stick my thumb well it's a really tiny thumb and um, I can come back and fill that in to to make my thumb but then I'm back onto my circle so I can just keep going around and around and around so it's just a continuation of that so again I'm just gonna pick up my stitch go under under and then over, over, over. And so I can pretty much ignore this little gap that I've got in there. Let's do a couple stitches in there so that it, so under, under, over, over, over. And my working length is getting, there we go. Get my other tail, tails get in the way all the time. So when you're ready, you can come back and you can actually then use this as your base because this can be your opening and you can then stitch I'll even stick my thumb through there so you can see so you can actually then start stitching around your thumb to then create your thumb same thing with a heel you basically it would just a really tiny thumb so that it gives you that turn that you then need to fill in that that gap for your for your heel I'm like just making sure this makes sense so I'm just gonna go under under over so I think that's pretty much it so I can show you the Oslo stitch now if you want mm -hmm. so the Oslo stitch um, it has an under over under over over so it's at the bottom there I don't know if it's in focus it's really hard to tell mm, that's as close as it gets I think. yeah yeah I don't want to I want you guys to see it space yeah it's like uh, yeah. zoom in yeah I know it's kind of like and zoom in anyways so it's called the Oslo stitch or under over under over over or type 2a <laughs> like I said it's like um yeah so um, again this one you can do it with chains and it's not as twisty but it's also then it's not as stretchy 
So just like the other ones is I'm going to pick up my base stitch because I want to actually continue my mitten and I'm going under one, I'm going over the one and then I'm switching back on the direction so I have to go under and then over, over. I'm just going to leave it right like that so you guys can see. So I've gone under, I've gone over, I've gone under, I've gone over and then over. So. That's why I find this method, I can actually see my stitches rather than, and again, I'm using my thumb to keep my loops big enough so I can still find them when I come back to look for them. And I'm getting twisty, so I'm untwisting the yarn. Grab your base stitch. It's under, over, under, over, over. So you can see this is where the, the, if you've seen any of the other YouTube videos with the thumb, they talk about putting your needle under the X. Well, there's the X. It's just not on my thumb. I just leave it free hand, freely sitting there and then pull through. And again, I only just use my thumb for, for tension. So you can see this difference. I've done a few. It's kind of, once you get to see this, you, you'll see that it looks like a, actually kind of looks like a double crochet stitch because it's got a bit of a twist in the middle. Whereas the Jorvik stitch doesn't have a lot of that twist. And it's kind of neat. So they look very different when they're done. Um, this one, these ones are Oslo stitch. So you can actually see there's this little kind of line going through them. And, uh, and then there's, that's where that twist is in the middle. Um, and again, like I said, it doesn't have a lot of curl to it. The Jorvik stitch does have quite a bit of curl to it. Um, I don't think I have any Jorvik stitch examples with me. It's like I've got a ton of them here, but. I don't have any Arabic stitch examples, but I think they're all in socks in people's mm -hmm. shoes. But um, but yeah, so that's the Oslo stitch. So I'll do another couple more of those. So it's under, over, under, over. And then pull through. And same thing if you're doing a chain with that one. The only thing you skip is picking up from the base stitch. You just start there and you do the under, over, under, over, over. So there, I don't have my base stitch in that one. I think that's everything. Cool. So yeah, so the tricks with um, adding in the thumb, uh, just you'll start with a fresh new piece of, of length. Um, and basically when you pull your needle through, just leave the tail sticking out. So similar to how you do embroidery and then just start stitching and going around, add a few extra in the corners, just because then you have loops to build on. But um, but then, yeah, and then you're just working around and around and around till you get to the end. And yeah, like it's, it's pretty, uh, you can be a, quite creative with this. Um, what I'll also then show you is what to do with this little tail that's kind of in the way. Unless if, of course you do what I just did, which is the little loop on it. But when you wanna come back, and tuck this one in. So because it's wool, um, you're, it's pretty easy to get it to lock in so that it won't come unraveled later on. Now this is a pretty big needle, so I'm not gonna have much of a tail to work with here. Um, so you can go and find that darning needle. But what I'm doing is I'm basically, I'm gonna pull my little flower, original flower nice and tight so it, there's no hole in, in the top because when it's loose, you're gonna see this nice I'm going to loosen it up so you can see it. You know, this hole in the top of your two, the toe, and toes and fingers love going through holes. So you don't want that. So you're going to want to tighten up that little flower so it's this nice little tight little bud there. And then if you notice it was going in this, I'm seeing it as a counterclockwise, well, clockwise, sorry, clockwise direction. And I'm actually just going to shove my needle into some loops and just start going around in that same, continue in that clockwise direction for a bit so that I've gone around that original petal. Now you know it's gonna be a little tight going through, but it'll get there because I stitch with a fairly loose stitch. And then you can keep just working your way around and around and around, just hiding basically those, that tail in amongst. And what I find that does is it just, it just helps lock it in. Then you can also then change directions and basically start going the other way, back around just until you basically feel like, okay, that sucker's not gonna go anywhere right now, so I can just, you can then cut it off. So then it's not in your way 
anymore but just make sure you go around you can go around three times if you want to I'm just showing you a couple times cut it off add that to the stuffing pile and at least now that tail will not be in your way and it'll be out of the way and it's locking and all that stuff when you actually go and full the the yarn uh, all those little holes and stuff it'll all get felted together and that's it so feel free to ask questions if there's anything else you guys wanted to learn but I think I covered everything. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>